Welcome back to Sound 101. I'm Andrew from Deity Microphones, and with me is Deity Steve. Hey. It is nice to have you here, man. It has been lonely without you, and I'm glad you're back in the studio. Yeah, virtual conversations only get us so far. And because Deity Steve is in the house with us today, that means it's mailbag time. So if you are new to the channel, what a mailbag episode is all about is we answer your questions here on the channel. We pull the best ones possible and we take those questions, throw them up on our laptop and we quiz each other to see who can actually do a really good answer. So Steve, are you ready? I'm ready. Hit me. I've got one from Abraham and okay. that is this. What would you recommend for where to hide microphones in a car scene with four actors? The good news is that we have done a video on this. We had Thomas Pop on, we covered a couple different methods of how to mic up people in a car. A little bit tricky, but there are a lot of places to hide them. Some of the hot spots are in the visors. You can hide lobs up there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times on bloopers, you'll see people have forgotten to properly hide their lobs. You'll see a little something sticking out of there. Mm -hmm. 10 times out of 10, it's a lob. If you're miking people in the back seat, there is some room in the pouch that is on the back of the front seat that you can hide a cardioid or a super cardioid, some more directional microphone, and you can capture their audio pretty well, especially if you're shooting from the front of the car, you're never gonna see the back of those seats, so that's totally a safe zone. There are a lot of blind spots, if you will, in a car where you can hide these microphones, but I think those are really the first two that you should hit, the visor and then the pouch of the back seat. Fairly good answer, yeah. Okay, I am ready. Toss me one, Steve. All right, here it comes from Atmos Sounds. What equipment should I first purchase instead of renting it every time? Gotcha. This is one of those big topics that people always have is you should rent when you're starting out. And that used to be probably the case when a recorder was like four to the eight grand for just a basic recorder. And then your shotguns were like a thousand dollars and your boom pole was 600. And you know, it made sense the rent back then. But in modern times, you can get a very capable recorder for less than $1,000. You can get a very good shotgun microphone and a very good boom pole for less than 500. And you can really start doing probably about 90% of your work with those three items. A good boom pole with a shotgun and a good recorder. I mean, of course, you're gonna buy things like a bag, XLR cables, you're not gonna rent a bag. Those are the little basic things that you definitely should have. Wireless, you can rent when you're starting out still because you may want to rent wireless. You may not always need them, but a good shotgun microphone and recorder is like the bare minimum you need to still to own nowadays. Everything else you can start the rent and then little by little buy your wireless. As you buy the wireless, make sure you buy lavaliers. You're not renting lavaliers because that's just kind of inconvenient to buy one thing and still have to rent the little accessories to make it work. Just buy it all at once. You know, Hollywood shot movies for like 80 years with just a boom. Then wireless came out and it was reliable enough, but you may only have one or two channels. And only recently are we seeing lavaliers on every single actor. So it was good enough for 80 years of Hollywood. It's good enough for you today. Well, Steve, I've got one for you now. And it is from Jonas. And that is, do you choose the type of microphone based on the type of voice? And if so, what do you pay attention to? You certainly can, and it's a good idea to have a good idea. This is Almost. more than I've spoken in the past four months. So It really depends on who you're working with, and you should be aware of this before you go into a production, because male and female voices, usually that's kind of our, our initial binary. Male voices are generally a little bit deeper, a little bit lower frequency than female voices. Between the two of them, there's always outliers, but usually that's how it'll work. And similarly, microphones will have an ideal frequency range. Kind of like a pre-baked in EQ, right? Exactly. We call it frequency response. And you can see this on a frequency response chart. You can see it on a frequency response chart. You should look at that chart. You want to match so that the microphone is basically making up for what the voice is not having. You don't want to double up on the frequencies. So if you have someone who has a deeper voice and your microphone seems to be accentuating the lower frequencies, you're going to be doubling up on the low end. It's going to sound very muddy, not clear at all. So more ideally, you would have a microphone that has a bit of a brighter sound, a bit more accentuated in the high end, and that way it'll kind of bounce itself out and you'll get a more even frequency response. Right. But yeah. it's really just the way that a person's voice is interacting with different types of microphones. And if you're shopping for a microphone, you can go on YouTube, find a YouTuber who you think has a similar voice to you and see what microphone they're using. If you like the sound of it, 
There you go. I actually don't know the, the answer to the second part of this question, but what about between different types of microphones? Dynamic, ribbon, condenser. Is Does one favor a certain frequency range in terms of vocal? I think ribbons always kind of favor bass. Uh, they seem always to mean- Warmer sound. Yeah, they got that warmer. But really that means the diaphragm is just looser and that it's actually kind of keeping the reverb of that, that move going a little bit longer, whereas a tighter diaphragm is sharp and very staccato yeah. in its pickup. So that's also something that we think about. It's a personal preference at the end of the day. All right, Andrew, you ready for your last question? I am ready. This question comes from Timote Sape Trumpf. I believe you. Who asks, I wanted to ask you guys if you could give us some advice or tips for recording in extreme sport activities like mountaineering, paragliding, climbing, etc. For example, I'm preparing a six not have access to electricity for equipment. We'll be recording athletes most of the time. If you have any tips, it'd be most appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the first thing you should think about is can you safely mic the athlete? You know, like if you're mountain climbing, the last thing I want is to get tangled on something like a cord, like a lav, right? But if I can safely get away with a lav, that's going to be my go-to for this situation mm -hmm. because odds are, Unless you're like also a mountain climber, you're gonna be a distance away from the person, which means your boom mic is not gonna work. You're not gonna get like a 64 foot boom pole and mic a mountain climber, right? That's just not gonna happen. A lot of your shots are probably also gonna be wide angle shots. So your on camera mic is probably gonna be further away, which means you yourself are further away from the source and we're square law, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's just not gonna sound good. A lavalier though would always sound good. Now the extreme part of this means you're in unfavorable climates you're in a situation in which wind is probably you're gonna be your number one enemy. So if that's the case, you could totally check out our video about wind protection right here. Or what you can also do is get yourself like a little wind bubble from Bubble Bee or the wind jammer that comes with our w -Lav. You put that right over the little uh, lavalier head and I would fully expose it right outside the skin with that little fur. So if you're okay with that, if you're okay with showing the fur ball, number one choice would be that. This leads me to a question, actually. I was just watching uh, the original Point Break, and Ooh. near the end, there's a skydiving scene. Ooh. Audio is really good. I was very, I didn't, how did they do that? So in 1991, the options for wireless probably was not great. From what I remember, it's probably only about two brands that actually made a decent enough wireless for cinema. Could have been a love, but I mean, if they're skydiving, it's probably ADR, buddy. I hate to break it to you. I thought that, it just sounded really good. Back when they could make cool original movies that weren't sequels. Or squeakles. Still looking at you, chipmunks. <laughs> Well, that is our episode. Four questions up, four questions down. Steve, it has been a joy to have you back in the studio. I have missed you, buddy. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you back. And it's great to actually be able to answer y'all's questions. If you have more questions, drop them down in that section below. We go down there, we deep dive, and we pull these questions. If you do like this kind of content, don't forget that subscribe button. Hit that bell for notifications because that will tell you when we drop new content on this channel every single week. I'm Andrew D. Microphones. You are Deity Steve. That is another episode in the can. <laughs>